Hi everyone, uh, today we're going to be talking a bit about GraphQL and the lessons that we've learned from implementing a GraphQL API. So my name is Dirk, it's my buddy Fullentine, I'm going to be presenting with Inno today. And uh, we're really excited about GraphQL, we think it's an awesome technology and it uh, gives us a lot of flexibility and that's why we wanted to present it to you today. So first a question, who has read or heard about GraphQL? Basically everyone. Who has actually played around a bit with GraphQL and implemented something? Oh, it's quite a few, nice, nice. So hopefully some new stuff for those people and... Actually, okay, final question, who has a GraphQL API in production? Nice, cool guys. <laughs> so, um, a bit about us, my name is Dirk, and like I said, for one time we're both software engineers uh, working on the back end. We write uh, predominantly in JavaScript, and we're working for a company called Hyder, way in the south, and I don't know if you guys know the city master. Oh. <laughs> yeah, it was a That's long train ride with all the delays and horrible, but we made it, so it's, uh, it's fine. <laughs> and um, yeah, Hyder aims to improve uh, the customer experience in the insurance industry uh, by using uh, yeah, new technology. So one of our technologies is course GraphQL that we're using. Um, so a bit about the agenda of today. We're going to be talking about what GraphQL is, to give a little bit of an introduction. Um, and why, also why it's awesome. And then we're going to talk about some lessons that we've learned from implementing uh, an API. So first, uh, what is GraphQL? Well, in a single sentence, it's a query language for your API. And it has some uh, nice properties. So the client is in control of the data uh, that's retrieved from the API and not the server. And this creates a lot of flexibility because you don't have the problem of uh, overfetching data. Um, Another key advantage is that you can get multiple resources in a single request in contrast to uh, or something like a REST API. The documentation is super awesome. Uh, we're going to show you a bit uh, about how the, how the documentation works in GraphQL, but it's really a first class citizen and we think it's, uh, it really helps you implement a GraphQL API when the documentation is this good. And it's a full pipe system for your API, so when you write a query to a GraphQL API, it performs automatic query validation, it gives you uh, proper error messages, and it's just a really nice way to work. And you can also define things like uh, objects, a bit like uh, just any programming language, like classes, you can define objects, uh, they have primitives like string, integers, and floats that you can use. So it's really um, nice in that way. And there's some really cool developer tools. So one of them is GraphIQL. We're actually going to show it uh, soon. And um, <coughs> this is a really nice tool for uh, actually testing out your GraphQL uh, queries. So we've uh, got a small demo set up to just show you how it works a bit for the people that are not really familiar with it. So in this demo, we've um, created a joke machine. So this is an API for uh, basically uh, retrieving jokes and, uh, and doing all kinds of operational jokes. We've included some jokes, so uh, be prepared to like laugh like crazy. <laughs> okay, so this joke is really nice. Form that actually came up with it, so it's an original. We did not grab this from the internet. Joke is a font so size. Sorry? <laughs> joke is a font size? Joke is a font size. Oh, sorry. Alright, read it. Read it. Better like this? Yep. You guys read it now? <laughs> sorry. For me, it's super clear, of course, but you know. <laughs> So, um, yeah, so what we have here is a tool called Graph IQL, and it's basically like an IDE environment for uh, writing and validating your GraphQL queries, and you can test them out. And this is used a lot by our front end people for uh, writing the queries that they actually need to implement in the front end, and it really helps you a lot. Um, this tool it provides you with handy error messages if you make a mistake. For example, uh, it shows you the inline documentation, so you see on the bottom here that we've got a the currently authenticated user that we're dealing with when we're requesting the viewer. Um, and an awesome thing about GraphQL is that you can really build up your query. So the client is in control of the data that's uh, retrieved and not the server. So currently we've got a query implemented on the left there where we're requesting the currently uh, authenticated user. And then for this user we're requesting one of his jokes for a certain ID. And then for the joke that we're retrieving, we're finding out the ID, the text, and the funny level. And so uh, on the right here, we see the response. And the response <coughs> mimics the, the fields that we're requesting on the left. So if you write your query, it's pretty obvious what the response is going to be in the JSON because the keys are, uh, are very similar. 
Uh, a nice advantage of GraphQL is that it's, like I said, the client is in control of the data that's requested. So if the client thinks, oh, I don't want to know the funny level, you just delete it, rerun your query, and the funny level is gone, and you're not overfetching anything, and it's very flexible in that way. You don't need to make any changes to your server. Um, a bit about the documentation that we talked about. When you're uh, implementing an API, documentation is very important. It's not always the case that it's up to date uh, with APIs, but in GraphQL, this is uh, really nicely dealt with. So on the right here, we have a documentation explorer that basically uh, shows you all the queries and mutations that you can make. So queries are used to actually retrieve data, and mutations are used to make changes to your, uh, your uh, database. So if we look here at the query that we can retrieve, uh, we're currently looking at the viewer on the left, and that returns a user type, and the user type contains some fields like the ID, the name. Uh, you can get an array of jokes, or you can get a single joke or an ID. And um, you can see the types on the right and the description of what you're retrieving. So super awesome. I hope you guys uh, can see uh, why we like it. And uh, this is just a short introduction of how it works. We'd love to go into more of this, but uh, we want to get to our lessons. Um, so the first lesson, uh, separation of concerns. So when you're building a graphical API, uh, you're starting out by building it. How should you structure your code in the back end to uh, keep it maintainable over, over time? Um, so if we start very simple, we have this query that we want to implement, or we want to retrieve a joke for a certain ID. And for this joke, we want to retrieve the ID, the text, and the funny level. So how do we go about implementing this? Well, we've got an implementation here in JavaScript, but GraphQL can be implemented in any language, so you don't need to do it in JavaScript if you want. But here the joke is implemented uh, as follows. We see here that it returns a GraphQL joke. That's the type uh, field. Uh, it contains some arguments uh, like the ID, which is a type GraphQL ID, and it must be non-null. So if you write a request, where you don't add a, uh, an ID, it will immediately give you an error. And on the bottom here, we have a resolver function. And this resolver function is basically called whenever you do a query to, uh, to GraphQL. So anytime a query is made for the joke, this resolver function is called. And basically, uh, when you implement it, you need to uh, get the data that is requested. So here it's very simple. If we want to find the joke by an ID, we simply go to our database. We call uh, find by ID, or whatever database you guys are using, doesn't matter. And then we pass in the args.id to retrieve the joke. But we're not really done yet. We also need to take into account authorization. So it should, it's very painful for privacy if I'm retrieving someone else's jokes. Uh, we want to prevent this. Uh, and to do this, you may, we need to add some authorization to our, um, our code. So to do this, we use the field here called context. This is the third parameter here. And the context contain, is a data object that contains some contextual data about the request that's currently being passed uh, into GraphQL. So it's very common for an authenticated API to, that you pass in the, the currently authenticated user inside the viewer um, properly in this context. So we've implemented this here. So if we add authorization, what we first do is we retrieve a joke by its ID. If there's no joke for this ID, we simply return null. And then we have an authorization step where we say uh, that a joke can only be seen by its creator. So what happens, we take the creator ID inside of the, the data coming from the database, and then we check if it's equal to the viewer, uh, viewer's ID in the context. And if it's possible for this uh, joke to be seen, then we return data. Otherwise, we would just simply return not because it doesn't exist for this user. Um, what you see here is that we're returning a GraphQL joke, and this is an object type in GraphQL. So how do we go about implementing this? Well, we simply use a GraphQL object type for this. Where we uh, implement the fields. So we say we have an ID, a text, and a funny level. These are all non-null, um, and an ID, string, and integer, respectively. And again, here we see these resolver functions. And these resolver functions are used to uh, give these fields actual data. So if we go back to the query that we've implemented here, uh, you can see that we're returning some data there on the bottom. And this data is passed directly into the resolver functions of the type that's being returned. 
And then simply these resolver functions maps to the type, to the corresponding type in the data. It's very simple. So the result um, is a very funny joke. You guys like it? <laughs> Good, right? See, all on the internet. The funny result was zero for a reason. <laughs> Oh, I know. Nice. Next, uh, suppose now we want to update a joke. That's good laughs. Right? <laughs> all this humor here. Uh, suppose now that we want to update a joke where we're passing a certain joke ID and we say this joke is so funny it must have a funny level 10. And then for this updated joke we want to retrieve the ID, the text, and the funny level. So quite a simple mutation. How would we go about implementing this? Well, quite similar to the, to the query that we made. Um, we say here that this mutation returns a type graphical joke. It's non null in this case. There's a description there uh, to say that this is an update to a joke. And then we pass in the arguments of the joke ID and the funny level, and we give them the appropriate type. And then again, we run into this resolve function. This resolve function basically says, tells you to implement some functionality to update the joke in the database. So how will we go about implementing this? Um, very simple, we, we perform some validation on the funny level that's passed in. So if, if it's not between 0 and 5, then it's uh, invalid. You can't go beyond the funny level 5 because nothing is that funny. Um, then we simply request the data from the database. Um, and if it doesn't exist in the database, we throw a new error that it doesn't exist. And then we perform some authorization, just like the authorization that we did for the query to make sure that um, the person trying to change the data is actually the creator of the, the joke. And finally, we perform the update where we say that the funny level is equal to the new funny level. We save the data, and then we return the data. data. And one thing that we can note here is that we've implemented exactly the same authorization logic in this resolver as the authorization logic that we implemented in the query before. Can you make it bigger a bit? So can I make it bigger? Of course I can. Yeah, same time. Nice. Can you guys see better now? <laughs> Just tell me quickly so uh, you don't lose half of the uh, presentation. Uh, um, so yeah, we've implemented the authorization step again to make sure that uh, the joke can only be updated by its creator. And this signals a problem because these resolvers, the resolver here and the resolver uh, in the query are completely independent of each other, but they're using the same authorization step. This signals a problem that grows as your schema will grow, and I'll, I'll go into that later. Um, the mutation result that we get here is an error, where we say invalid funny level, because we passed the funny level 10, and uh, this joke isn't that funny. Um, so suppose now that we're going to build out our schema, right? The schema has started small with a query and a mutation. Now we want to add some functionality to re retrieve a list of jokes, to delete a certain joke, to create a joke, and so on and so on. Your schema will keep growing and growing and growing. And uh, something is going to happen. We're going to get authorization and database logic all over the place. So you saw with the query and the mutation that we already have some separate authorization logic there. It's very easy uh, when you're implementing a GraphQL API for this to like explode out of control. And you uh, end up with a code base that's not really maintainable. And this is something that you don't really don't want. Um, some direct effects, if this happens, is that your logic will be spread around independent graphical resolvers that are very hard to keep in sync. So if you change the authorization step in, a, in one resolver, you need to make sure that you all also update it in the other resolvers. Otherwise, you'll start getting errors in your API. Testing is very difficult because we're putting so much knowledge <coughs> inside of these resolver functions together with GraphQL. We're putting everything together. Testing is very difficult when you do this. We need to tear it apart to make it more testable. And because everything is so independent of each other, it's really hard to maintain. And some long-term issues of this is that uh, because we've um, added or really linked our logic so close to GraphQL, it becomes very hard to switch to another API protocol if we wish, because all the logic is intertwined with GraphQL. And another Why would you want that? What? Why would you want that? Well, of course, that was awesome. Why would you want that? I decided to switch to core, core and what's on. <laughs> yeah, I know. Facebook comes out with something even more awesome than maybe you want to switch. Um, and um, another thing to note here is that we've really uh, put the database logic uh, of the specific database that we're using also in these resolver functions. So if we were to change to another database type, this would be a massive undertaking to rip apart and then 
put back again. So this is very dangerous. So what is the solution? Separation, of course. Um, Graftol.org on the very bottom, they propose the following split where they say you have a very thin layer, which is your GraphQL API. Then you have a very big part, which is a business logic layer, which also performs the authorization. And then you have a small part underneath, the persistence layer. Uh, and they propose this split. And uh, what you notice here is that this is a very loose layer. So if you wanted to switch it out, uh, it would be a lot easier if we put a lot of the logic inside of the middle part. And I'll get more into how you would implement this. But first, what is the business logic responsible for? It can be the single source of truth for enforcing some business rules. So for example, we saw the authorization step that we did. This is something that has to go inside of the business logic. It determines how data, data is retrieved, created, and updated from the database. Uh, so we have to perform authorization for the data. And it also performs some validation to make sure that any input that's provided through the API conforms to the correct business rules. So we have our split now. How are we going to implement this in code? Well, instead of putting all of the logic inside of the resolver functions, we're going to map directly to the business logic. So if we go back to the, to the query that we saw at the beginning, we wanted to retrieve a joke for ID1. How, uh, so before the split, our resolver looked like this. It was, uh, contained quite a lot of logic. After the split, it is a lot simpler. So now we're importing a joke object from our logic folder. And uh, the resolver maps straight to the joke.gen, which is a static initializer on the joke class. Uh, it, it maps straight to that. And it passes the, the viewer and the ID that's being retrieved. Could you go back one slide? Yeah, sorry. One, one more slide. See the difference one more. Yeah. So we're putting all of the retrieval logic here and the authorization logic. And now, after the split, we're basically, yeah. the resolver acts directly as a tunnel that maps straight to the business logic. So this, if you wanted to take this away, it would be very easy, because there's really not a very strong connection here. Um, how will we implement this, uh, this joke thing in the logic? Well, very simple, it's a class called joke with a um, constructor called a gen, which uh, takes in the viewer, and the ID of the joke being retrieved. And it performs the authorization logic uh, inside of this uh, static constructor. And then the constructor takes the um, data that's coming straight from the uh, database. And it wraps it in some class properties. Um, and some things to note here is that uh, this gen method can be called anywhere in your GraphQL schema. So if you have, like let's say, five locations where you want to retrieve a joke, they can all map to this gen method here, and you can make sure that you have a single source of truth for authorization. Make sure that uh, authorization always takes place in the same way. And um, finally, what we're also doing here is we're wrapping our database. So if you wanted to change our database type, we would only have to uh, update it here in the business logic layer, and we would not have to rip it apart from our GraphQL um, implementation. Sorry, I saw a question. Yeah, quick question. Uh, this whole thing is about uh, preventing overfetching? No, this whole thing is about... Well. <laughs> Sorry, yeah. And what, what I see here is that basically this is the thing that actually determines what gets returned. Mm -hmm. So you, yes. you still fetch all the data. Yeah. This is despite of, of, of GraphQL or whatever, because yeah. that's just how data yeah, yeah. interfaces work. Am I knowledge? Yeah. According to my knowledge. And here you actually uh, map the stuff that you get returned from the database mm -hmm. to something that you want to return to the client. Uh, yeah. Right. yeah. So isn't that what you always do if you use GraphQL or whatever else? Uh, yeah, it's completely failed to understand the... Yeah, yeah, so basically what I'm trying to represent here is that we're basically doing the same as we did before. We're retrieving something from the database and we're mapping it to resolver functions, like we saw before with the database. But uh, what we want to enforce here is authorization rules to make sure that if someone is retrieving a joke, a certain authorized user, a certain authenticated user, that, they're, um, that we always make sure that uh, the privacy concerns are uh, upheld so that we can make sure in a single location that the authorization is correct. We don't want to write that logic in all kinds of different places. We want to have it in a single, single location inside this class. And that's kind of what we're trying to represent here. 
that, yeah, I understand that, but I thought that the whole way of, of structuring the query in the beginning with GraphQL, yeah. where you define the, the fields that you actually want to return, yeah. that that would be some kind of, of magic that, that would transfer to the database. Yeah, well, actually, that's what you can do with the fourth parameter of uh, resolve function, which uh, has uh, some meta information about your query. So out of that information, you can extract the fields that user uh, requested, mm -hmm. and then uh, you can use those fields in order to make a more fine-grained uh, like query to a database, and uh, it will. Yeah, you, you can do it as well. So this is what we do, for example, for our API. Yeah, so it's pretty flexible. Actually. So this is the authorization. Um, next, suppose now we look at the mutation to update a joke uh, that we saw earlier. We want to update a joke for a certain ID and the funny level, and then we want to return the ID, the text, and the funny level of this uh, mutated joke. So again, here we have the, the GraphQL implementation that we saw earlier. And now we need to do something in the resolve function. Um, so what are we going to do? We're going to uh, perform some authorization by retrieving the joke for the joke ID. Um, then we're going to perform um, some validation and update the database in a um, instance method on the joke class. And you see here that the authorization that we're doing is the same as we're doing for retrieving a joke by its ID. And this really keeps the system maintainable and understandable for uh, programmers. Because as your uh, schema uh, expands, you're getting more and more types. Um, it becomes very difficult to uh, control the beast that is authorization. And you don't want any uh, errors to go to your client. So this is a really an uh, important lesson that we've learned. And we actually got this from uh, best practices that Facebook has done. There's a, so there's a talk uh, from React Europe 2016 given by Dan Schaefer where he outlines this approach, and this is also the approach that Facebook has taken with their uh, API to make sure that all the types that they have, that they have a maintainable way of ensuring uh, authorization. It's a mutable state, right? Yeah, yeah. So this is the split that we proposed. And the benefits, as mentioned earlier, there's a single source of truth for enforcing business rules. It's a lot more testable now because we can really fight, write focus tests to our business logic layer and our GraphQL layer. It's a lot more maintainable because every all the complexity is controlled in a single object. And that's the first lesson. I'm going to hand it over now to Fondheim. He's going to talk about the second lesson. Number two, uh, we believe it's very helpful to implement a relay compliant schema. So, um, what is a relay compliant schema? So, basically, first, what is relay? A relay is a uh, client library that is used in combination with React to communicate with your GraphQL backend. Uh, but to use relay, you need a relay compliant schema. Uh, so, what is so special about this schema? Well, this GraphQL schema makes uh, some strong assumptions about refetching, pagination, and realizing mutation predictability. Um, in the next couple of sections, uh, I'll give some advantages of why this is, uh, yeah, why this, this is helpful. So first of all, client-side caching. So suppose we have the following query. Uh, we have a query where, for the authenticated user, we are retrieving the ID. And uh, for, we are also retrieving uh, his or her jokes. Um, um, and for each joke, we are only retrieving the ID. If you look at this result, we see a couple of things. First of all, um, the, both the ID of the viewer and the ID of the joke are equal to one. Um, this is actually undesirable for a couple of reasons. First of all, likely uh, there is some database logic um, shown here because uh, it's likely just the ID, uh, ID that is used uh, for each database row. You don't want to show uh, this in your result that is uh, um, shown in the client. And second of all, uh, you. Yeah, second of all, uh, these IDs are now the same. If you want to implement client-side caching, 
uh, it's, it's preferable to have um, globally unique IDs because in this case, caching on the client side is a lot easier. So what is the solution? Well, create globally unique opaque IDs for all GraphQL objects that you return to the client. So if you now look at the same query and we look at the new result where we have two very opaque uh, strings, well, you cannot write, write any database uh, logic around this. Well, you, you can only make the assumption that all database IDs are animals. You see it? And go in the uh, sheep and monkey. There you go. Uh, yes, and, and second of all, yeah, because they are unique now, client side caching becomes very easy. So these are the, uh, yeah, the two results that I just discussed. Um, but there's another advantage. Namely, uh, that every object can easily be refetched. In a relay-compliant GraphQL schema, there's something um, which is called a, uh, a node field, which, which brings us to refetching. So in a relay-compliant schema, we have uh, the node field, and basically what it returns is an object that conforms to the uh, node interface. And with this, you are able to refetch any object for which you have an ID. And in this case, uh, yeah, we provide the ID Easter egg, uh, we can just return the ID because this is in the interface. And then since we know uh, that it is a joke that we are retrieving, we can also retrieve the title and the funniness using an inline fragment. Uh, this is how it's called in GraphQL. Um, so yeah, this is how it works. So if you then go back to the example, uh, we see here a... Make it bigger. Oh yeah, <laughs> very good. Thank you. So yeah, we are retrieving a node here, and um, we are writing an inline fragment for both the joke and the user. But since uh, yeah, it, it's the object that is retrieved from the database is a joke, you will only see the ID here, the text, and the funny level. Uh, since it's not a user, this will not be shown. So how does this work in the back end? So basically, this ID, when the, when the query comes in, this ID is then first split into a type and into a database ID. And then thereafter, because the type is known, you can just uh, point to the right database table and you can then retrieve uh, yeah, the, the, the object that corresponds to that ID. Uh, and thereafter, uh, it's passed to GraphQL, who can then determine for each fragment whether it can return any information. And then the result will be this. Do you secure that layer? Sorry. Do you secure that layer? 100%, yeah. So, so basically, yeah, good to say it. You can only, of course, um, so basically how you secure it, uh, every request you send to the server, uh, you, you, uh, how we do it, we send a bearer token uh, and we just determine um, uh, what user belongs to this uh, bearer token and then we set the context that they are talk about and in the context we define a viewer and then using the same authentication logic as Dirk described, we can then um, uh, determine whether you can actually retrieve the object that also that ID. So yeah, the third advantage, pagination. Well, suppose you have a person that really likes storing jokes in, uh, in the joke machine. Um, well, suppose that person stored a thousand jokes and that we wrote a client that wants to retrieve those uh, thousand jokes. Well, you can imagine that this is not very, uh, perfor well, performing very well. The backend needs to load all these items into memory. The, 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 the amount of data that needs to be downloaded uh, is quite a lot, which can be slow, and also this data needs to be processed on the client. So uh, then why pagination? Well, pagination gives you more fine grained control about how you retrieve this data. You can just retrieve subsets of information, yeah, which, of course, you want. It prevents your app from being slow, mainly because uh, yeah, you need to download less data at once and can also improve your backend performance. So, uh, yeah, how is, how is this done in a relay compliant schema? Well, if we look at this, um, at this query, we are retrieving jokes and uh, we are specifying two arguments. The first argument is first and the second argument after. So basically what the, uh, what the author act argument is, it's a cursor which specifies the position where you are in your ordered list of jokes. And then the first argument first then specifies the maximum number of items that you return. 
So basically what you then return is a, are two fields. The first field, edges. This, so each Joe corresponds to an edge, and for each edge we can then retrieve the cursor, which we can then use in the next query to um, uh, retrieve the uh, next collection of jokes, and we retrieve <coughs> no, which is basically just the joke here. And then we have a second argument, which is called page info, and this has a Boolean has next page. Why do you want to have this? Well, suppose you have only 10 jokes, and you are requesting the first 10, uh, then now, in a single request, you can immediately determine whether there uh, are still any jokes left after this joke. Well, uh, if you would not have had this has next page boolean, you would have, have to do a second request to the server to determine whether there are any jokes available still. So we also have a small example here. So we are again... Uh, Make font bigger. Yeah, very good. <laughs> very good. So some very awesome jokes again. Uh, yeah, in this case we are retrieving the first four jokes, and if we look at the response, we can for each joke we uh, the, also the cursor is specified, and now we can just say, well, suppose we take this cursor. So after the first four items, after the first four items, you would like to yeah, grab the next page, um, then we can. <laughs> <laughs> uh, use that cursor and then retrieve the next uh, four, and then we see that we only have two. And also, the has next, next page boolean is also set to false because there are no more um, items stored for this individual. So yeah, that's pagination uh, done right. Uh, for, for a advantage is the opportunity to change the relay if you wish. We actually at our company don't use Relay itself, but we find we use Apollo, different library, but we still find that, uh, that, that yeah, a Relay compliant GraphQL schema really helps us to, um, yeah, to, to get a great experience. So in a nutshell, what are the advantages, in our opinion, about Relay, sorry, for implementing a Relay compliant schema? Uh, so it helps you to enforce globally unique IDs that are uh, opaque which makes client-side caching very easy. So with using this node field, you can um, query any resource that belongs to you using a single query, which is very helpful. Pagination for lists is built in. Well, it's not built in, but uh, for example, if you're implementing, in, in, implementing it in JavaScript, you have this library called GraphQL Relay.js, and this library uh, yeah, gives you a collection of helper functions, which makes implementing pagination a lot easier. And finally, you uh, can switch to Relay if you wish. It's a popular library, so this makes sense. So to sum up, first Dirk told about, um, well, explain this, why it is very important to make a very clear distinction between your API, in this case, a GraphQL API, your business logic, and your persistence layer, with as its largest benefit, um, yeah, realizing a single source of truth for enforcing your business logic. Lesson number two, we believe it's very helpful to implement a relay combined schema. Well, actually, we were a bit naive because during the preparation for our talk, we actually had three more lessons in mind, and we also prepared them. We kind of uh, yeah, we timed it, and then we saw that it was a bit uh, too much. So basically, if you feel free to talk about any of those uh, things after <coughs> the talk with us, we would love to talk about it. So basically, uh, the authentication, how you could do server-side caching <coughs> and batching, uh, and how you can best implement error handling in a GraphQL backend. You can reach us on Twitter uh, anytime. That's it. <laughs> <laughs>